What's up, guys? Welcome to the Governor's Podcast with your hosts, Matt Sartrek and myself, Peter Fendera. This is a podcast where I tackle current health news and hot urgent topics, one conversation at a time. For everybody that's checking us out on YouTube, we got some dope ass mugs here, a couple nurses and that loud mugs. And if you guys haven't heard about that loud, it's our Patreon content, exclusive content, subscription based. But you know, don't that let don't let that hold you back. Great content on there. It's some of our more personalities because as you guys know, we've been polled a few times. So on that loud, we discuss things more freely. You could say we cover a wide range of topics. Uh, we have some nurse specific content where we have these nursing debriefments in the car, which is very interesting for all you nurses out there. And we also have just some shenanigans from nonsense that we talk about. But for you guys that are not in Patreon and not just on YouTube, thank you for your Spotify listens, your Apple podcast listens. Make sure you subscribe, make sure you like, make sure you give us some ratings, leave some comments. What's up, man? I'm doing good, man. We haven't got behind this mic for a couple of days, so it's kind of refreshing. While you enjoy your little cup of green tea. In this episode, we're going to talk about stress and anxiety as a nurse, but more specifically, how to manage your mental wellness inside of work and outside of work, because we know that we can't eliminate stress completely. But if you know how to pinpoint it, we could eliminate it, we could reduce the symptoms. And if we properly understand our feelings and where they come from, it's a game changer. Of course, nursing is easily or any medical professional can say or can vouch for that being in, in medicine, being in a nursing field is probably one of the most stressful positions you could be in. I second that. Right. And maybe something over that was probably like probably the army going into war. That's probably it's crazy too. But this is more on like a, you know, social level where you're actually in the country. Super stressful. Like this is more stressful than working in a cubicle, more stressful than finance. This is super stressful. So there's no way, like Matt said, for us to completely eliminate stress and anxiety. It's just part of life. You get stressed on occasion. You feel anxious, you know probably more frequently than, than you would like, but those are just emotions and feelings that we have to deal with. Yeah. And there's no way or there's no algorithm or nothing that you do to completely silence them. It's just a part of life. But what we could do is we learn how to manage them so we can understand that that these feelings are going to happen and we could learn how to properly manage them and kind of find our triggers and see how we cope the best. Because we're all independent individuals and we're all going to experience stress, anxiety a little bit differently and we're all going to have different kind of coping mechanisms. And don't forget, it's a safety mechanism. You know what I mean? The small amounts of stress, the acute phases, it's healthy for you. It, it makes you a little bit more aware and everything else, you know, but once you reach that point of chronic stress, burnout and everything that you do day in, day out and you don't properly take care of yourself, it adds on. And in this, you know, hyperactive society where we're always stimulated, our phones are like our worst nemesis, even though they're, you know, part of our life, part of our extension to our own mm -hmm. oneself technically now, right? Um, it, it's hard, man. It's hard to kind of like have time to sit down and like notice your feelings and how you're feeling, you know? Right. Yeah. So I did some, some scouring the web and I found out the three most common things that stress nurses out the most. First one's gonna be workload lack of support, and working with the sick. So workload we could all vouch for, especially if your hospital, if your facility, or your nursing home, or whatever you work, doesn't have specific guidelines on ratios. Like, yep. in, like in the Midwest, we never had ratios, but you know we still try to manage patients appropriately depending on their acuity, right? Here in California, we have a little bit more stricter guidelines, so the workload is still super heavy, but you're not as overworked you could say as you are in, in the midwest because sometimes in the midwest you'd have two really sick patients and you get a third one that isn't so sick but still that's adding on to that workload yeah. so that's obviously going to be a number one cause of stress because if you go into work and you get more of a workload than you had the prior night or more of a workload than you're accustomed to that's going to be stress within itself just because you got to do that much more patient care you have to time you have to time manage more properly, more accurately, and you're just, just so busy. There's times where you're working on a 12-hour shift and you barely have time to go to the bathroom, and that sucks. But then, of course, there's a flip side where, where there's days where you have an easier assignment, so sometimes it does balance it out. But e either way, a tough workload or a workload that's, that's higher than you know the standard, it's going to add on much more stress than you already are. Yeah, not to mention, so like, yeah, there's workload, right? That's a huge aspect of it. And you know how we talked about all these great traits you should have as a nurse, as an ICU nurse, being organized, time management, all this. Well, if your workload is increased, you tend to forget that stuff. You tend to go off your structure and you tend to go into this neurotic brain and you're just running around and you can't like, you, it's, it's a weird feeling, man. Like when, you know, when you're stuck in the heat of the moment at work 
and you're just like f m l how do i like wrap my stuff around and like what i like to do when it comes to the workload is as soon as i know where i'm getting like stressed out meaning there's too much on my hands the the first thing i like to do is write it all down i like to take stress off my mind by remembering these things just drop dropping it down on alcohol pads like if you if you look at me post shift i have alcohol pads of random things all over the place like i tend to throw them out all the time but that's how i like to kind of manage that workload because once it happens like i say man you just like tend to forget all your damn skills and all your like little little secret cheat sheet organization ways of doing things yeah i personally instead of the alcohol wipe, i just write my whatever i need to write down on the just uh the door because everything is see-through right you get the, like yeah. the ceramic or whatever glass whatever they're, they're made of fiberglass i don't know the material but you write it's it with just glass with, yeah write it with dry erase and you know instead of like pulling that that alcohol wipe from your pocket from like a covid room you just see it on the on the screen yeah and it's also going to depend on every single unit so every single unit gets smarter to do things just like when like covid first came out like we didn't know how to approach the situation then we said hey we should get a bunch of extension tubing and manage drips outside mm -hmm. and that's what we've been doing correct just like what we did now is every single patient's room should have a whiteboard mm -hmm. you take a black marker and you write down temperatures, urine outputs, everything you need to on this whiteboard. Then you just freaking put a piece of tape, tape it to the window. You get out of the room, you have all your numbers there and you don't have to remember them. Yeah, see, I mean, but if you have a glass door, it's right on the glass. Like, you don't have to waste your time that too. running on a whiteboard. Like when you go by my rooms, there's numbers, temperatures, weights, urine outputs, like me doing random math equations on, on, on the thing just because it's simple and you could always come back to it. Yeah, like, like yesterday for CRT, I just took that whiteboard and I wrote, cause you have to write down inputs daily, the TMP and the, all the pressures for CRT. It's a convenience for me to use the, the whiteboard. Can you just leave that screen on always open? Is that possible to give you all your numbers? So you have to go inside, you just use your phone to zoom in. You can, but the backdrop to that is you don't see what is the next intervention on the machine. Oh. So it tells you, hey, you have an hour and 15 minutes, so you have to change the effluent bag mm -hmm. or hey, you got to change the diacylate bag. Yeah. It doesn't pop up when you see all the numbers. Mm -hmm. I know, right? right? That's one thing they probably should have made better if you yeah. think about it. Yeah, but nobody was expecting this to happen, you know, to us. Uh, number two, number the second issue that stresses nurses out the most is lack of support. And specifically, when I was looking into this, it's lack of support through management and lack of support through through peers. So nurses have a heightened amount of stress and anxiety if they're always a one-man army. So that being said, that sometimes, you know, I like being a one-man army. But I kind of know my boundaries on when I would need help, you know. Yeah. So not I'm, not I'm not saying that doing everything yourself is is a, is a bad idea. The thing is, like, issues arise and stress gets heightened when you need help and no one's there to help you, or you have coworkers that don't want to help you, that rather sit there and chart than help you turn a patient, help you boost a patient, help you with patient care. So that's where nurses are stressed out, and also, like I said before, management. So if you have lack of support to management, so you know, our our manager here at, at our hospital is great, Dave. He is, he's, man. He's, he's, he's amazing. Like, I've had a few different managers, and our turnover rate for managers in, a, in my prior hospital was, was you know, on the higher side, but that's okay. And Dave does a really good job. So he's very personable. He's very, um, he's soft-smoking. He's nice. So you got to have a good manager to kind of rally the, the troops, you know, because if you have a boring huddle every day and you're just going over the same stuff every day, every day, and, and he's just reading everything from the paper top to bottom, that's boring. That doesn't contribute to any kind of knowledge or anything because nurses aren't going to listen to it. Like, first of all, we don't even want to do huddle. Because we just want to get our patients and get them, move on with our day. Yeah. But if you have a manager that's, you know, a little bit more excited and explains things, answers your questions, walks by and says, hey, Peter, how you doing, man? How's your shift? You know, glad you guys made your contract. You know, that's a lot better Hell compared yeah. to like the manager that comes in, you know, doesn't answer any of your questions, things like that. So a lot of managers, um, they don't always have a super medical background. Yeah. But those managers that, that have been a nurse in the past are are, are very exceptional. They're, they're, they're very well well mentally trained on it because they've yeah. been in your shoes so they know how to kind of interact with you and and know how to talk to bond and know what you go through and yeah and like dude leadership is one of those things where it just doesn't come naturally for some people you know some people are natural born leaders like look at history and like the roman empires and stuff you needed a leader to hold the glue together you know yeah. like right now in america maybe we don't have great leadership <laughs> and that's causing issues so definitely having a strong leader like you know when like there's specific charge nurses on it makes a difference mm -hmm. you know when you have great nurses that come in on your shift, you're like, damn, it's gonna be a smooth night because you know everybody's on their game. Right. It, it makes a difference, like lack of support is huge. And then as well, when it comes to different parts of the world or America nursing, right? Like here, we at least have runners, they get like 
uh, this week we had EMTs that came from a freaking fire department that were helping us do things, mm -hmm. helping us check sugars, helping us throughout the trash, take labs down, all this little stuff. It it's makes, so beneficial, right? It's, it's crazy. so beneficial. And like in the Midwest, like, dude, I have never seen that before. Mm -hmm. It was just us. It was just the nurses that are taking care of patients. That's it. No CNAs, no nothing. And like, dude, it burns you out because that nurse has two patients to deal with. And then you got a patient sitting in poop for like a whole hour and you can't do it yourself. Yeah. It's messed up. Yeah. Even and that though, stresses you out. Right. And even though they're not nurses and they can't do technically nursing care, but just them being there around just for like a boost, like I might say, take out the trash, these little things that, that we have to do ourselves that will take up time that don't really evolve a lot of thinking, a lot of mental processing, but it just takes up time. Right. So anyway, especially now with, with C19 going around, any way you could find a way to free up a nurse's time, super beneficial. It yep. doesn't matter if they're an EMT. doesn't matter if there's a volunteer. You know, dude, like those guys were clutch, man. Yeah. Super clutch. And plus it's cool because they're firefighters, so they're like a bunch of bros. Mm -hmm. And I honestly like working with a couple of dudes. Like it's just funny to talk shit mm -hmm. and like just mess around. Like it, environment. it makes such a, yeah, it makes a different environment. Mm -hmm. Plus female coworkers have told me that they prefer sometimes working with males just just the energy and everything that they you know create in the workplace yeah. just like i'm sure the firefighters felt the same way but opposite you know yeah probably, like they work with a bunch of dudes all day maybe you get a female here and there and now they enter this this hospital where it's like all chicks and like a few dudes yeah so it's they're living life guys yeah so it's completely different for them you know i wonder how they they, they probably felt the testosterone probably boosted up a little bit or like damn dude all women here huh yeah you know so it's, it's different so they probably like that too they're but, changing those trash bags awfully quick yeah man. dude yeah <laughs> awfully efficient and it's like cool because they get that kind of perspective too yeah but you know they get they get the benefit of it being short term so they don't have like those long-term negatives that kind of come with it. I don't yeah. want to say that there's long, I don't want to say that there's a lot of negatives working with females, but you know how it gets sometimes. And yeah. if a woman, you know, gets a little you bicker amongst yourself too. Yeah. Caddy. Yeah. yeah. And a third one for you guys that stresses nurses out, if it's, you know, if it's, if it's rough out there, then it's working with the sick in general. So nurses work with the sick. All we do is work with the sick. If you're healthy, you're not in a hospital yeah. unless you're in there for like a uh, elective procedure or, or something, you know, but if you're in a hospital, you're sick and that takes a toll on you. Like that stresses you out. Like, especially when you have those days where patients aren't getting better, you know, things are just are not going your way. You keep getting people that are real sick or, you know, if you're in med surge or tele, you keep getting those patients that keep, keep uh, turning into rapids and you just yeah. see people deteriorate and, you know, they get sicker and sicker and that, that pulls you down as well. Not only does that mess with your feelings, but it also is going to affect your stress too. You know, dealing with somebody that, that's, that's like sick and, you know, is about, is about to die. The emotions that come with it isn't really like, like you can't really picture it as a stress, you know, while we talk to you, but like the emotion that you experience, so sadness, grief, uh, maybe frustration, even though that's not stress itself, that adds on to the stress yeah. because now, now you're struggling to kind of figure out where you are an emotional standpoint. And if you can't figure out where you are in an emotional standpoint, that's going to lead to stress. It's not always work involved, you know. It's not always you trying to time manage. It's not always you physically taking action that's stressing you out. Sometimes it's just like your emotions, you know, emotional roller coaster that's stressing you out. Yeah, you're like overwhelmed, mm -hmm. patient load. Speaking of emotions, man, um, we don't have families coming in, right? It, it changes the dynamic. I think when families come in, it's a lot more emotional because of the way they feel. So yesterday... Uh, I don't think I could talk about age and stuff on a podcast, no, right? right? Okay, so say, like uh, from this age, generalized, this age. yeah, damn HIPAA. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a a guy in in the twenties in the ICU, and he's on full vent support. He's on ECMO, and I'm getting chills right now. Mm -hmm. And then like you know, I saw his you know stepdad in the room, and like you know they're taking turns, and like the um, the the brother came and it's just like, dude, just seeing that like breaks my heart, dude. You got to see your own son just laying there and he, and he looks like, you know, he honestly looks like a corpse. It looks so sad. And then like that, like yesterday that put me in emotional roller coaster. I'm like, damn, I forgot how that feels, you know, because, you know, being a natural empath and just being empathetic to, to begin with, for, with nursing, it's like, you just, it just rubs off on you, man. You, you feel them like you feel the sadness and grief and yeah, man, if you don't, if you don't learn how to compartmentalize it or how to like properly cope with it, just like we're talking about this episode, man, after a while it gets to you. Mm -hmm. It really yeah. does. Yeah, like when I walked into work and I, and I saw him there and he's very similar age to myself, I was like, because you don't really see it very often, um, people in that age that, that have C19, right? It's not very yeah. common. So like that kind of gave me perspective, like damn, 
Like I know that people my age are dying from C nineteen. Like it's that's like yeah. you know it's it happens. People die from a lot of stuff in my age, right? But seeing it firsthand is a little different because I walked by the room and I was like, "Damn!" I, first of all, first of all, I thought of what were his, his uh, comorbidities, what are yeah. his issues, why did he? We, actually We should come say there? that on the podcast really quick. Like the reason why this person was there and he's very sick, like diabetic, hypertension and morbidly obese like you know these are symptoms that are causing a lot of issues to COVID to begin with and unfortunately that's why he's like a fatality of COVID. yeah yeah and i walked by the room and i like i said the first thing i thought about was his comorbidities and like man i explained them and then i then i was like well you know thank god or, or thank whoever that you know i have the knowledge that i learned growing up the importance of of exercise and nutrition yeah. and being healthy because, you know, if, if I wasn't always fit and healthy, you know, like in high school, I wasn't the most fit or healthiest person. Like, you know, and I'm sure, you know, you can test that too. Like yeah. people aren't fit their whole life. They're not bored, fit, healthy and exercising, you know. So like I just kind of walked by the room and I thought about it. It's like, damn, I wonder what would have happened to me if I never got into nutrition or fitness or exercise. Yeah. I might have been, you know, in, in his shoes or even when I had my, my bowel resection. Imagine if I, if I had diabetes, hypertension, I wouldn't have as successful recovery process as, I, as I've had, you know. So it did give me like a reality check, but it also showed me that, that hey, this person is, is there um, because of his own issues, right? It's yeah. not just, you know, random. There's things that happen randomly, you know, shit happens, life moves on. <laughs> But him in that place, like I was comparing myself to him, himself to me. And like, I saw a lot of similarities and then I saw a lot of differences. And, you know, as humans, we're all very similar, but the way we're unique is based on our differences, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, and it is what it is, bro. And that's why it comes down to like accountability, right? Like with everything that's happening now, like I hope this is a giant wake up call to America and be like, damn. We're, we're one of the richest countries and all this beautiful stuff. Like, we're the gold standard in the world, America, this, America, that. Yet, like 40% plus of our population is obese. And now, the reason why we're having a pandemic is we, we, we are literally immunocompromised from decades of shitty eating. And, you know, we could blame other people. We could blame, you know, external sources for creating this food and marketing. But at the end of the day, it's our choices that puts us in this position. Right. And you, like the whole blame game, like the whole with like the word blame and stuff, like you're always pinpointing something, right? So there's always yeah. something to blame. It's like your friends, your your health, your, you know, have enough time, your work, you even blame yourself. And like, I don't even use the word blame anymore. I don't blame myself for anything. Yep. Like, it's just like things happen and you kind of take action, you, you react to it and you take action, and you kind of move from there. You can't just blame something because because yeah, people have bad intentions and they do things on purpose, but you know, like 50% it's them and the other half is you, yep. right? If someone keeps talking shit about you, you could either ignore it or you could, you know, succumb to it, right? It's it's the way you do it. So don't, personally, I, I don't blame anything. I don't even use the word blame very, very, uh, very often. So like even the stuff that happens to us at work, somebody don't, don't like us or whatever, like it just happens. Like I'm not going to blame them for, for, you know, getting us in trouble when they have, or anything like that. Like, it's yeah. just how life works and you move along with it. You roll with the punches, right? Exactly, No kind of different perspective to it. It's, yeah, it's just taking the step out of being a damn victim. Yeah. And you can tell when somebody's a victim, when, uh, uh, just their dialogue. Mm -hmm. You listen to their dialogue and you can, it takes a lot of self-awareness. It's an excuse, dude. And then, yeah, you can tell people are making excuses when they're like, I catch myself sometimes too. Like, maybe I'll have like a little slip up. I'm like, yo, Matt, why are you playing the victim game here, man? Like, yeah. snap out of this shit. Like, yeah. I am my own worst critic. I catch this right away, you know, punch myself mentally, technically, and I just kind of roll with it. Yeah, because like we've touched, talked about this before, like you're not your thoughts. We have these random thoughts that go, go through our head and we could do as much as we can to suppress them with meditation, yoga, reading, things like that. But, you know, those thoughts never, never go away. Like I've had some horrible thoughts where I was like, how the hell did I even think of this? You know, right. but we're not our thoughts. We're were our actions. That's why when people always ask, do you think the thought counts more than the action? I always say the action counts more. Yeah, hell yeah, you man. know because. But then again, it's it's flip side as well because you know, it, you know, it goes it goes both ways. But I'm just more of a, if if you're thinking about doing it, you're better off doing it than just thinking about it. Yeah, right? well, that's this whole culture of like, oh my god, like I need to manifest all this shit, and they like you know, nothing against manifesting. I do it myself, but if you manifest for thirty minutes a day. Well, how is it going to come true? You have to go put some concrete momentum behind that. You have to tell, let's just, where do you, let's just use the word of universe here. You have to tell the universe you are serious about what you're thinking and what you want to do. And that action is going to create the momentum 
and then the universe will bring it to you technically it's just how that works you know right like i so gave you the top three reasons why nurses are stressed out so now we have some tips and advice for you to kind of ease your stress or anxiety at work and the first one's going to be we talked about this a little bit before is first one's going to be ask for help like i'm a single unit and um if you see me at work majority of the time i'm alone doing it like yep. even when there's turns when there's booze sometimes i would rather just turn another patient and, and pull them up like I'm, I'm i'm like a single warrior I'm, i like doing everything myself because then i know it's handled instead of like passing it on somebody else that's just me preference and and does that does that have any drawbacks of course it has drawbacks i'm still working on it like i'm learning to ask more for help so you know that my back, back right so my back doesn't hurt as bad the next day and things like that because that adds up you know if you're working three in a row and you got a heavy set and you're doing all the turning yourself, you know, you start feeling that. And even if I'm 26 years old and I'm already feeling sometimes, like if I had yeah. a hard shift like that. I, I talked to a nurse that like she did an MRI for back pain and dude, she has micro tears yeah. on her lumbar. Mm -hmm. Like that's messed up, dude. All just from nursing because, you know, like you got a bunch of machines and cables, dude, you have, you do not have good form doing these boosts yeah. Yeah. whatsoever. And how that attributes to stress is, is like, is two ways. Physically wise, when we since we just talked about it, is hurting yourself. If you hurt yourself at work, or you feel burnt out of work, or you're physically you know sore the next day, that's gonna stress you out because you gotta go back and do the same thing. Or it's gonna stress you out because now you have to go home and deal with this, right? Yeah. Compared to just asking for somebody to help you. And the and the other thing I was going to or wanted to mention is is you have to ask for help, right? We can't read your minds. I have a good one for yeah. this one. So I just you, thought about that. Yeah, so you can't read your mind. So if you don't f verbally ask for help and you're stressed out and you're drowning in in patient care you're drowning in paperwork or drowning in whatever you have to have to do no one's gonna be there to help you. you you can't have support if you're not asking for support because nobody knows man yeah also you know how there's a thing that nurses always say sorry like people say sorry way too much it bothers the hell out of me i honestly tell people what are you sorry for I ask them and people don't know it's just like this habit but anyways we tend to play this victim mentality just by saying the word sorry you're playing the victim right we feel so bad that other nurses are like busy too that we st we don't ask for help because of that victim mentality. We just rather kind of suck it up ourselves, and in the long run, we're kind of hurting ourselves in the longevity standpoint because it's creating stress. Yeah, and just because like some a nurse is busy and you really need help, just ask them anyways. Because there's times where I'm super busy, and I know I'm behind, and nurse asks for help, and you know I still say yes, dude, because I know that if I'm in her shoes and I need help, somebody would also help me too. And like, I'm that kind of person that might as well, well put my stuff a little bit further back because I know I could catch up yep. and help somebody else because I'd rather help somebody else and have them, you know, do their work calmly and, and efficiently and effectively and have them, you know, be done in like a, like a, um, a time efficient manner. So they get less stress. Right. And yeah, I might take on a more stress during that point of time, but now that they're less stressed now. I'm catching up. I could always ask them back for help, you know, yeah. and opens up room for conversation. Like, you know, imagine if we didn't know each other, like, you know how easy it is to like get to know somebody, but just asking for help, you know, like how many times have you had a cool conversation with somebody because you asked for a bath a or something, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. And then also like once you go out your way and help other people and you should do that to begin with, like if you're done with your stuff, go ask all your coworkers for help because that's going to create the impression of your work ethic. And it's going to come full circle. You know what I mean? I don't know if karma is a real damn thing, but because it comes full circle, people will be more inclined to go ask you, hey, do you need help with something? And you're not going to feel sorry for it because you put in the same effort to other people. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you should expect, don't expect the same same thing you know, back because there's just shitty coworkers, unfortunately. Yeah. But at least you know that you did a good job and helped other people and you should get the same feedback back when it comes to help and everything else yeah beautiful this snowballs perfectly into our our second stress relieving um you could say stress relieving tip is to talk with your coworkers. and the easiest way to talk with your coworkers, to get to know somebody is like you said before is asking for help because how many times like i said before is how many times have you watched up a patient turning them getting them all situated and nice and you're out there just silent. Usually, sometimes you are silent because you know sometimes you just have that night where you don't really feel like talking, and other nurses feel like talking, so you're just kind of doing your task and moving on. But I've had some cool, general conversations with with nurses just by doing patient care, and it's like you get to know somebody. And once you know somebody, it's a lot easier to ask for help. It's a lot easier to communicate. It's a lot easier to get your needs met, and it just makes the work environment a lot smoother. Yeah, and I think also it's like the perfect time to bond and catch up with your coworkers when you're in the patient's room because. When a nurse is outside of the room, they're either looking at orders, charting, shit's going on. They're like busy with things. At least when they're helping you, they're there kind of 
present, you know, yeah, they're caring about what's going on with their patient, but they're a little bit more present and they're more inclined to kind of socialize in a way. Yeah. And then one thing that nurses have probably the hardest time with is like the emotional aspect, because as nurses, our friends aren't all nurses, right? So they don't really know what we go through emotionally. Yeah. Like there are some nurses that really take, take into heart a patient dying or a critically ill patient and they, they go home and cry and they don't really have anybody to express their emotions to, right? Because nobody understands. Like imagine you explain a situation to our buddy Conrad that, yeah. that does sales or our buddy Luke that does like the finance. Yeah, like, you can't. Yeah, they could help. I mean, they'll try to help, help you the best as you can get past it, but they don't really understand it compared to you talking um, to like a nurse at work that maybe you don't know the best, but at least they can relate on some kind of level. Yeah, and plus, and they could give you tips like mm -hmm. at the job site, what to do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I highly recommend, this is more of like a tip at like outside of work, but you should definitely have a friend outside of work that's in the medical field so you guys could somewhat relate right. it makes a difference you know and like you know for like the for the people that are in relationships and your significant other isn't a medical professional well you know they might not understand you they might not be able to you know help you cope with your emotions properly don't get stressed out to them they just simply don't understand the stuff that we're going through right. and it's good to have a you know a friend that does yeah and you have you literally work amongst them so if you don't have that friend outside of work well maybe you should try to make one at work and then that could extend to you know outside the workplace right yeah. we're not saying that hey you're going to find your best friend at work and you guys are going to be lovey-dovey forever but we're just saying that that you know there's times where you have a good relationship with a coworker, even though you guys don't hang out, you know, outside of work, you guys still shoot a text every once in a while to each other. Like, hey, what's up, what are you doing? Things like that. And they could be there for you at that, during that time, you know, but that's not gonna start until you open up as well to them, right? 100%, man. The next uh, tip to manage your stress at work would be time management as we talk about. So this is almost like putting yourself in competition with yourself. Like, look at yourself, look how you do the job, see where you could improve, see where you kind of get more frustrated and reverse engineer that problem, correct? Just like I told you guys, I have a lot of stress on my mind because I have to remember a lot of things. How do I reverse engineer that problem? I write down a bunch of things down so I'm not mentally thinking about it. They're in the notes. And then I just cross things off or I put check marks or you know, some nurses have like a six color damn pencil or pen that they kind of cross off. What, whatever will work for you, but reverse engineer your problem to see how you could be as self-efficient as uh, possible, you know, and that goes with everything, batch working your tasks or, you know, maybe you'll wait an extra half an hour so then you could come in there, do the meds and then check the two feeds, whatever it is, you know, mm -hmm. like learn how to batch up because batch working outside of work, inside of work is a freaking lifesaver. Yeah. And the number one thing that we mentioned that stress nurses out is a workload. So how do you solve a hard workload is with proper time management, right? So you could try and decrease that, that, that workload that you have, you know, so if you have, if you've been tripled on, on this night or the next night or whatever, if you've been tripled, you have the hardest assignment. So yeah, you have the hardest assignment. It sucks. You drew the small straw. How can you make it better? Well, let's plan out my day. I know it's going to be hard. It's going to be rough, but let me at least write down the schedule. I'm going to go in at this time to do this ABG. Then I have another ABG due at, at like midnight and I got to do one more at 6 a.m. So write that down. So you're on schedule, right? And then you got to give meds at 10 p.m., you know, one o'clock, get antibiotic, write all that stuff down because... A lot of times when you have a hard, hard workload and you have tough patients to do and you have a lot of patient care, you forget to do stuff. Yeah. And that's one thing that bothers me a lot. How many times have you, you um, like went home and you're like, damn, I forgot to do this. And you're just like, it's something so little, but just the fact that you didn't do it, it's just like, damn, I could have done it so easily. I just forgot to do it. Yep. You know, like getting a patient's weight. There's been a handful of times where I forgot to get a patient weight or I, I would get the weight, but I wouldn't chart it. You know, or I would um, get the weight and not write it on my, on, my, on my board and then forget it. Dude, I forgot to... Put in my way yesterday. <laughs> yeah, like it happened, but then it's like, damn, if I maybe would have wrote down 4 a.m. weight on my paper and I would have, you know, while well, I give a report, I'm like, damn, I forgot I tried to wait, but once I finish the report, I'll hop it on. Yeah. Because then you remind, you remind yourself. And that's, I feel like if nurses do that, if they're able to write down when they're going to do what, it's going to decrease a lot of stress. Because there are a lot of nurses that run around with their cuts cut off, they don't know what to do, do when. And even though their workload isn't as heavy as yours, just the fact that they have poor time management, they're increasing their, their, the work that they have to do. Yeah, and when you get into that state of like anxiety, stress and all that, like technically on a, like a neurological level, you're technically a different person. You have cortisol pumping, you have all this shit doing, like you're not thinking straight. So the name of the game is to be as less stressed as possible because that's when you could clearly think and execute and make great decisions, you know? Because you've had that moment where you're just like in paralysis and you're just like, uh... Yeah. 
So let's bounce into getting your home life figured out. Let's take a step back from work. Let's go into the home life. And one quote that I wanted to start this off with is that life is happening for you instead of to you. When, when people say life is happening to them, that's when that victim mentality happens. Like, oh, this happened, that happened. Oh, man. Like, you know what? They feel so unfortunate. And, and loss of control, dude. Yes. And when life is happening for you, you realize that there's certain circumstances that happen to you, but you are optimistic. The glass is half full and you tell yourself, wow, you know what? At least I had a great learning experience from this because failure will technically turn out to success in the long run. And there is some benefit to this. It's just literally changing your perspective and how you see things. Mm -hmm. And then life gets a little bit maybe easier and less stressful. Yeah. If you want to have a sustainable work environment, you're going to need to optimize your outside of work situations, right? Because there's how many times have you had those nurses come in and all you hear them talking about is their life outside of work. I don't have time for this. You know, this happened. I'm super stressed out. You know, that, and it's just on and on and on and on. And you're just like, how do you live with yourself like this? Like, how can you go home and like not have your stuff put together? Or, or even if you're like this at work and you're supposed to be a professional, imagine how much shit you talk outside of work, dude. But just imagine you know? the thoughts inside their own brain, yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. Like, it's, it's crazy. And like that probably is like the key to that is definitely health. Health, being healthy. So we, we're going to drill this into your, into your head for in 2021. Dude, this is every single podcast episode, Dude, I feel like. Yeah. Get it together. Right. When people, we think of health, everyone always thinks of physical health, like looking good, eating good, being, being healthy, things like that. But like the people, a lot of people kind of forget that if, think about it, if you're eating healthy, you are physically healthy, but look at what else you're, you're, you're doing. So good to the key to a good nutrition Look at what everything that's happening, happening around us. So you got to go to a store. You got to pick the proper products, right? So look how much your knowledge you have from that already, right? Then you got to cook the food yourself. Look how much knowledge you're doing that. And it's on a schedule, right? So all this isn't just, just physically beneficial. It's also like a training. You're also putting yourself on a schedule. You, you work out at a certain time and that's uh, continuous exercise. You know, you get that. Um, what, do you, what, how, what do you call it when you keep working out continuously? Continuously, yeah. When you habit, have a long set of consistency, like have the consistency, you get into that, and that's how you form new habits, and you become consistent in, uh, in other things. You don't become consistent in everything that, that you do, right? You build upon it, correct? Yeah. Right? You don't just become consistent in the, the in the gym, and then you become consistent at work, and then you become consistent with your finances. No, like it starts with one, and then those things escalate to to the other aspects of, of your life. Right. Yeah. Another example, like health. You know, we talk about our nutrition, how it's important, and like. I'm not, we're not going to go into details of why it's beneficial because there's a ton of information on our podcast about that. Another one, like look at exercise, correct? Like people associate exercise and working out with like, oh yeah, I look good. I got a six pack. My ass looks nice and tight. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it it's, not, it's not only about that. Like I look at the gym like as a mental exercise mm -hmm. sometimes. It's freaking therapy for me. Yeah. When, I, when I get in there and I had a long day at work or whatever shit's going on down in my life because my life's not perfect just like everybody else's, dude, it is therapeutic in there. I freaking, I freaking put those iron, it's iron therapy. I, I put all my energy, the negativity, whatever it is, out, mm. out, of my, out of my damn body into those weights. Yeah, it's, it's crazy because like, especially with like fear, like it might sound kind of weird, but there is times at the gym where you're putting on some heavy weight, you're just like, damn, I'm kind of scared to lift this. Yeah. And that over time, you're getting past those little hiccups, little barriers over time, adds on to you being able to do a lot more crazy shit in the future, a lot more things you put your mind to. Because if you keep training your brain, okay, I'm gonna lift 255, and you're like, it's kind of, 255 is kind of heavy, I don't know if I could do it, and you lift it, you're like, damn, I thought I couldn't do it, but I did it. Yeah. And next week you do 265, like, damn, I didn't think I could do it, and I could do it. And then you go to work, like, I don't know if I get the promotion, bang, I got the promotion. Like, it all, it, it all comes together throughout your, your whole living process, you could say. Like, Jim has probably taught me, like, the most important lessons of my life yeah. regarding structure, regarding what I could do mentally, regarding what I could do physically, regarding mental barriers, regarding communication, everything. Like you said, it's iron therapy, man. Yeah. Like sometimes when I think of myself, do I need a therapist? It's fucking weights on my therapy, dude. You know? Yep. No, I hundred percent, bro. And then, you know, this kind of starts tying into the next point. We're going to talk about time management, but if you set a routine for yourself and I talked about it on my page, like, let's just say you have a morning routine and you wake up and this is what I do. You stretch, you meditate, Maybe you read for 15 minutes. Just think about that mental boost that you're getting. Like, damn, I already accomplished these three things because 
these are the this is like a mental checklist you have for the morning. Mm -hmm. So you already read, you meditated, you stretched, you feel good, you're ready to go. Like it already changes your your what's it called? Your habit, your approach to life, the way you're gonna handle the situation throughout the day, instead of waking up, rolling out of bed and looking on social media for a few, few points, mm -hmm. something pissed you off on the news and you're already in fight or flight, and then your day goes like that throughout in that neurotic state. Instead of like taking time for the yeah. morning routine and you feel freaking sharp like a spear, man. Right. Mentally. Okay. Right. And if your time management is poor in a hospital, it's probably gonna be poor in real life too. So I was never good at time management and I'm still working on it every day. I'm as you know, Bro. I'm very forgetful like you, as yeah, Matt can man. vouch. I'm not the best with time management. <laughs> but the the thing is like I'm learning to live my life with less focus on time management because I'll, I'll get pissed off like damn why can't I manage my time properly but you know it's okay like, to each their own the thing is one main thing that I've learned from this is especially with doing this podcast and running the business is over ta over tasking yourself or putting too much goals for one day because it feels like shit if you write down a list of six things you want to accomplish today and you're gonna get three of them yep then you like feel like, feel like shit and just because you because just because you did three out of the six, it's not supposed to be negative. Like you're still moving forward, right? It's not like you did zero. It's not like you did negative one. You're still moving forward. But the fact that you're putting yourself into a hole, you're already setting yourself up for mental failure because you're expecting yourself to complete these six things. And anything below these six things is unacceptable. And instead of saying, hey, hey, man, I did this, this, and this. Let's move on to the next day. What can we do tomorrow? I'm like, hey, man. I mean, these three things. I didn't finish everything. Like, you feel like shit. You feel like garbage. Right. You're just like, damn, you feel depressed. You don't look at, hey, you did three things. That's three things more you did today than you had yesterday. And then guess what? Yeah. You have three things less to do tomorrow than you had the, the day yeah. prior. That's why you have to be very aware of how you react to your routines and everything because it's a. it sounds like a great idea that you have this checklist and you're knocking it out and, you know, you're staying on track. But yeah, once you get into the slip up of maybe over tasks and not have enough time, you start stressing yourself out from not doing the damn task. Right. So that's why it's very important, guys. Like, sit down with yourself once in a while. Maybe between, maybe when you wake up or maybe before bed and literally talk to yourself. Ask ask yourself how your day was, how certain situations made you feel. Like, learn how to, learn how to feel the emotion and think, jeez, uh, I want to explain like it. Learn but, about yourself. Discover yourself. Yeah, discover, but also sit with that emotion. See how it makes you feel. Like, I understand fear and anger and sadness is a bad emotion, but we are human and it's okay to feel that emotion. Feel it because it'll make you maybe adjust to, you know, to certain circumstances. And, you know, that's a problem in our society that we are always running. We're always, dude, our gears are always grinding. Mine are. Sometimes we don't have time to like, feel that emotion out and we're just numbing ourselves mm -hmm. whether it's with alcohol or drugs or you know food it's you know that's a, a, one of the therapies that people do they binge eat just you know f feel it out feel yourself out yeah especially if you guys are in your 20s like we're in our 20s too like we can relate to you guys very well in in our 20s like we're still trying to figure ourselves out dude yeah like i mean i don't want to talk about marriage and shit but <laughs> you know like when i see keep people getting married that are younger than me I'm thinking it back. I'm I'm just like they're like 22 or 23. I'm not saying don't get married, guys. I'm not, I'm not saying that. It's our opinion, bro. Yeah. They could either yeah do like it or not. Out. Yeah, if you're in, in heaven, if you just propose, don't call it off. Do your thing. I mean, maybe you want to call it off. I don't know. It's something you got to figure it out. Shit happens. Yeah, but I'm saying I'm I'm 26 years old and I still don't have my shit figured out. I still don't know what my end goal is. I'm not even sure what my future holds, and like I'm still trying to figure myself out, trying to learn learn learn, learn about myself, trying to figure out these emotions, like what's going what's going on, how does how does the bike actually work. And people are in their 22, 23, getting married. I'm just like, holy shit. Like, sometimes, like, it's not the best idea because if my opinion, I always say this a lot, is if, like, I don't know myself, then I don't have the, I'm not going to have the audacity to learn about somebody else, right? It's, yeah, it's just like that example of, like, a relationship, correct? <laughs> We're going on this. For the ladies here. out there. For the ladies out there, we got you. Couple nurses here. So it's like, how can you get into a relationship if you don't even know much about yourself or, or what makes you happy or what makes you happy or how to love your own self. Mm -hmm. How do you expect that own person to love you if you can't love yourself? And then that creates a lot of issues because in a relationship, it's this two way reflective mirror. Like let's look at jealousy. Let's just say you're a jealous person and your boyfriend or girlfriend did something and it was never in their intention to do so. But because you are a jealous person. It's that reflective mirror. And then it went into the relationship. Oh my God, 
Josh did this, what a mother effort, but really he didn't do anything. It's just your own self reacting to you. Yeah. You have to figure yourself out before you get serious and committed to someone, right. you know, yeah. like life is your own journey. And the last thing I want to leave off on is like, that's why in a relationship it's important to figure yourself out because you should be the rock for your other significant other. But also, you have to have a sense of individuality so you could go and pursue your own interests that bring you your own happiness, you know? Because how many times have people got into relationships, families, and they're like, wow, I don't have time for this anymore. And like, that's that, that there's that emotion that's always in the background there because you don't have that fulfillment of purpose, you know, in life. Right. And we're not saying don't get into relationship. Like, part of learning about yourself and learning about life is relationships. We're just saying don't commit to one person, you know, too soon because as part of life, we we build ourselves and the environment around us off relationships, right? Like how are you going to know how to have a girlfriend if you've never had a girlfriend before, right? How are you going to know how to talk to a girl if you've never talked to a girl before? You know, that's just, that's how life goes on. We, we we learn by by going through these steps, right? Just the thing is like committing somebody long term for the rest of your life, that's a giant step. You know, compared to casually dating somebody, right? And you're going to learn about yourself casually dating somebody because if you didn't date anybody throughout your whole life, how are you going to be ready for marriage in the future, right? If you guys are into marriage and stuff like that. 100%, bro. Yeah. Let's Pretty wrap good. this one up. I think it was a good one. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we talked about stress and anxiety both in the workplace and how to manage it in the workplace and outside. And ultimately, you have to be accountable for your emotions, your feelings. No one is going to help you but yourself. So... It's a very good time to get serious about them and become self-aware and try to troubleshoot all your stress. Yep. Shout out to all our frontline warriors out there. Keep it up. Peace. Peace.